What's wrong with the world? Some call it being pessimistic or negative. Some even say that it is unspiritual. Some believe that the sadness that they feel is a malaise and a discontent best treated with upbeat music. Maybe a bit of Galway Girl by Ed Sheeran or Troublemaker by Ollie Murs or Firework by Katy Perry. You choose. Or maybe a brisk walk in the open air. Always good for the mind and helps clear the head. But what if it isn't enough? Maybe the best way to deal with sadness is to string together some random Christian phrases and use a bit of cliche-riddled Christianese. That'll do. All things work together for good. Well, it must be God's will. God has good plans for you. At the bottom of any such answers, however, is the notion that the sadness itself the deep intuitive sense of something being wrong with the world we live in and the way we treat people is an idea that should be resisted in the first place. Is the, pro is the profound sense of sadness that so often strikes a person's life like a rabbit hole leading nowhere good something that we should resist? Or is it a moment when we can discover something deeper more beautiful, more hopeful, more honest, and more holy than we could ever imagine. How do we react to moments of sadness? Maybe like the character of Job from the Old Testament, who at the beginning of his story, with superficial smugness and self-righteous self-justification, answers nonchalantly, or are we like Job at the end of his story, who has discovered something, or rather someone, who is stronger than himself, stronger than he could ever have hoped for, closer than he could ever have dreamed, and more gracious than he could ever have thought possible? Do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about a fundamental sadness, I wonder? The sadness that seems to be part of all things. I think you probably do. Most people do. Sometimes it's a very personal thing. It's the loss of a sister or a father or a good friend. Sometimes it's the loss of your country or long treasured plans that have collapsed around you. Sometimes the sadness is more global. It's the emotional darkness that comes after you hear about a shooting in a school. Or 250,000 people dead after a tsunami on Boxing Day. Or a shooting in Las Vegas or a bomb in Mogadishu. Or the persecution of innocent people like the, the Yazidis. Or attacks in London or in Paris. Or the plight of the Rohingya or the devastation in Raqqa. Sometimes it's triggered by hashtags like Me Too. Or bring back our girls. It's the blazing sunset that sears, not because of who's present, but because of who's absent. It's the empty chair on Christmas Day. It's the crying baby in another mother's arms that taunts your empty ones. It's the background sadness, the fundamental and seemingly underneath everything kind of sadness that many people run away from. It's another failed job application. It's the injustice and the unfairness of life. It's the one who sees the beauty of the dawn, but feels deep in his or her gut that they know dusk is coming. The sunrise always precedes sunset. It's the lover who knows at the beginning of a beautiful kiss that it will end. G.K. Chesterton, the famous 20th century mystic and novelist, wrote this. Of all conceivable things, the most acutely dangerous thing is to be alive. I want to suggest to you 
that an answer to this fundamental sadness this evening, which is so transforming it can lift our hearts as possible, an answer that gives us hope, it's the reason that we can get out of bed in the morning, it is the life that outlives death, the hope that outlives despair, the possibility that outlives failure. And I want to suggest to you that by and large in the Christian church, we've lost the ability to tell this story. Where are the C.S. Lewis's and the G.K. Chesterton's of the 21st century that can speak in ways that can capture an imagination and lift a whole generation and help them see that hope is possible in the midst of despair? You see, the answer that I want to give you this evening is echoed in all the great stories of the world. Marius and Cosette making it through. Um, I should ask, where is he? Richard Butcher to come at this stage, but I'm not going to. And Jean Valjean being seen to be the better man. It's Quasimodo being loved. It's the story of the good guy winning, the right thing being done in the end. It's the Saving Private Ryan story. It's the Dunkirk story. It's the Darkest Hour story. It's the story behind superheroes, Marvel movies, Guardians of the Galaxy. It's the hope and pride and prejudice, the love that wins the day in Rebecca. It's Harry and Hermione winning. It's Sam and Frodo making it to the cracks of doom. I could go on and on and on, but you're hoping I won't. It is the great story. All the others are echoes of it. But they are echoes of it because the original story is whispering somewhere deep down in our souls. It's the deep longing of the human heart for good to triumph over evil. For kindness to win the day. For love to be stronger than hate. The fiction that we read doesn't create that yearning. It taps into it. The yearning is part of what it means to be a human being. Part of what it means to be alive. I have a phrase that I've been using for years now to describe this deeper story. And it's what I want to talk to you about this evening. It's a simple, clear easy to understand phrase. If we can grasp it, it'll change our lives. It'll strengthen our resolves. It'll put steel into our spines. God wins is the phrase. Death doesn't win. Sin doesn't win. Despair doesn't win. Sickness doesn't win. Hatred doesn't win. Sorrow doesn't win. God wins. It's echoed Throughout the Bible, God's inspired and infallible word. Listen to some excerpts from it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. After um, Adam and Eve, those prime human beings, have been captured in sin and turned their back on God. God says this to the serpent that has tempted them. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will strike your head, but you will strike his heel. An echo, a whisper of victory. He will strike your head, but it will cost something. You will strike his heel. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. After Noah and the flood, God says this, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. Nor will I ever again destroy ever living, every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed times and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Or what about this? As God calls his people and through Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verse 2. The father of the Jewish people. He says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And how does that story of Job that I mentioned earlier end? Well, in chapter 42, verse 10 of his story, we read this. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You hear the story echoed through the songs and the laments and the prayers and the cries of the people of Israel. We call it the book of Psalms. 
Psalm 5, verse 11. Let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them so that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. Or perhaps the most beautiful of all from that wonderful hymn book and prayer book, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our strength. And on the psalm goes. The song of victory. This God wins refrain. Is heard in the repeated cry of the people of Israel and the church through the years and the people of heaven. God is good and his mercies endure forever. It's the power of God at work in the world, setting things right, taking the brokenness of broken people and the fragments of a fragmented world and putting them right. But how does he do it? Where is the root of this great story? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In his victory over sin and death and hell. That's why I'm a Christian. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin. He was buried and dead and lifeless. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And a revolution of hope and life began that no one has been able to stop. That's why Josh began this service this evening. Thank you, Josh, with a song about resurrection. Jesus is not still in a tomb. Christians don't believe that we worship a God who died and stayed dead. We believe we worship a God who died, was buried, and rose again. And then rising again, let the great story of hope and life and forgiveness and mercy and grace be unleashed by the power of God for all who will receive it. The Apostle Paul was convinced of it. Listen to what he wrote to a church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And listen carefully to the words from verse 20 on. In Christ, if, in fact Christ, if in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, then he is the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, listen, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him. So that God may be all in all. Abbreviated version. God wins. In Christ he wins in the created order. In Christ he wins in the lives of believers. He wins over principalities and powers and spiritual forces and wickedness and rulers in high places. No one can defeat him. No one is stronger than him. No one is cleverer than him. No one is wiser than him. No one sees round the corner like him. God wins. But all of this requires something. Of you and of me. It requires 
that we understand the real story and not only the half-baked version of life that our culture tries to peddle us. You live in a story where it's all wrong. You're surrounded in a culture in Europe in a story that says you can make yourself happy. The more stuff you have, the happier you will be. The better position you have, the happier you will be. The more you satisfy your desires, the happier you will be. All of it's a lie. The more you satisfy your desires, the more your desires will consume you until there's nothing left of you. You can't satisfy desire. It promises a moment of fulfillment and then it takes more and more and more and more until there's nothing left. And you're left a human shell. And it doesn't matter whether that desire is sexual or financial or alcohol or drugs or power or position or prestige or respectability. It's a liar. Here in South Buckinghamshire, there are so many things that can grab our attention like anywhere else in this country. We're not any worse or any better than anywhere else. There might be slightly different labels to the things that grab our attention. We think our children have to be educated in private schools. We think we have to send them to 15 or 16 different clubs. They have to speak all these different languages. They all have to go to university. They all have to get a good degree. They all have to be doctors or mechanics or lawyers. They all have to be movers and shakers. But it's a lie. It's a cultural lie that will consume you until there's nothing left. If we want the hope of the Godwin story then we have to res resist and reject the lie of our culture. And what about churches? <laughs> A good band will make us happy. Great lights will make us happy. A good pastor will make us happy. A brilliant building with three itches at the beginning, that will make us happy. A clear strategic plan will make us happy. But none of that is the story of our lives. None of that is true. Back to that prayer book, that lament and cry and celebration book that has shaped the church and flowed out of Israel. Psalm 37, do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take the light in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light, and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Or the same psalmist making a determined declaration in Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord my, let the humble hear and be glad, who magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So here's the real story. The story upon which the whole of the Christian life is built. It isn't complicated, but it is very countercultural. We are so deeply broken, we will never be able to mend ourselves. That hole in our lives, no matter how much we pour into it, nothing can fulfill it. We can't fix ourselves. No amount of power or poverty or sacrifice or anything else can fix the problem that we have. Someone else has to do it for us. The second part of that story is, you live in a broken and a fragile world which is full of unfairness and sorrow and hurt. And that's not going to change. Not without somebody changing it. The currency of life is one of unfairness, sorrow and pain. We are so lost that we cannot find our own way out. And as a result, we settle for second best. 
second best satisfactions of our desires. The things that almost make us happy. And we replace the thing that can make us happy with the stuff that makes us happy for a while. But here's the great story. God has made a way. In this remarkable story of hope, God has made a way. Not by sending someone else, not by getting a recruit, not by sending a lieutenant or a second lieutenant, but by coming himself. By enrobing himself in human flesh and identifying himself with our problems, by stepping on the earth which is fractured, breathing in the air which is broken, he comes amongst us. And he carries our sin and he removes our obstacles and he offers us forgiveness and life. And he takes it all the way to a place where he dies. And one of the last things he says as he dies is, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Offering forgiveness not just to those on that day, but to all who will call upon his name. So far, so okay. Then he dies and they bury him. And he doesn't stay dead. I would have thought that deserved something of a celebration. He breaks the bonds of darkness. He breaks the bonds of death. Our rescuer rises. Our salvation breaks through the earth. And he offers forgiveness and life and mercy to anyone who comes. And none of us qualify. We haven't earned this. We can't do anything to keep it. It's not about how good we are. And yet everyone who calls in his name, he welcomes into this great story and offers victory and life to you. Paul put it this way, in case you feel as if you are perhaps more righteous or I'm more righteous and it must be other bad people for whom Christ died. He writes to the people in Ephesians and he says this in Ephesus and Ephesians 2, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work amongst those who are disobedient. All of us once lived amongst them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared for us to do. That's good news. And that's an offer of life to everyone online, everyone on Facebook, whatever country you're in, whatever darkness surrounds you, whatever context you find yourself in, and it's an offer of life to you. And it's an offer of life to me that will never end. Life that will never be removed. Life that can never be destroyed. Life that can never be broken. So we somehow need to learn to live in this victory of God and Christ. And that victory of God and Christ is the victory of God for the whole creation. For the world and for the universe. It's your victory. It's my victory with all my brokenness and my sorrow and my sadness and my uncertainty. I lean into Christ's victory. Paul writing to the Colossians says this in chapter 2. When you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When he forgave us all our trespasses. Erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them. 
triumphing over them in it. Every sin forgiven, every separation removed, every sense of worthlessness obliterated by the grace and the mercy of God in Christ. How can it be possible? How can such life and forgiveness and hope be possible? And yet it is possible. We evangelicals are very good at pointing that in on us. But what about a fractured world? This saves and redeems the creation. This transforms the very ground we walk on. The very globe that we live on is transformed by what Christ has done. Is that a big enough vision for you? Is it a big enough imagination that can capture that God is transforming the universe through Jesus Christ and what he has done? We need to learn to reject the wrong story and live in the right one. Anybody read C.S. Lewis? Wave at me if you've liked or read C.S. Lewis. Some of you have. We read it to our children. I love him. His books, the Narnia Chronicles, tell the story of an ordinary family who find their way through a wardrobe into a very odd world called Narnia. Where things are strange and a battle is raging for the heart of the land between a white witch who knows deep magic and those who are trying to resist her. And it's always winter. And they're losing the battle. The goodies are losing the battle. There's a great lion in the story called Aslan. Who is a picture of Jesus Christ. Who dies on the, the table of sadness. Giving up his life. To, to rescue the people of Narnia. I want to read a little clip from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to you. What C.S. Lewis describes in his chronicles as deep magic, I want to talk to you about his beautiful grace. Here's what beautiful grace does. It means that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a deeper magic that she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have read there a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. A willing victim who had committed no treachery himself was willing to lay down his life. Then death would crack. The table would crack and death would work backwards. The willing victim for us was Jesus Christ. The table of sadness was the cross where hell and Satan and all that was evil threw everything they could at him. And in their glorious moment of darkness, they thought they had won. But in their moment of apparent victory, it was the victory of God that was breaking through, which is what the Apostle Paul refers to in Colossians 2.15, which I just read to you. At the very moment when hell and darkness and sin and wickedness and evil was shouting, we killed him. God was crying, it is finished. I have broken the table. Death itself is about to be defeated and life is about to erupt in the earth. We have settled for the wrong things. G.K. Chesterton once said, Instead, we need to allow the divine discontent that whispers in our hearts and in our souls to rise up until the only answer that will satisfy it is Jesus Christ. We have come to the wrong star, Jess Chesterton said in orthodoxy. This is what makes life at once so splendid and so strange. The true happiness is that we don't fit. We come from somewhere else. We have lost our way. That's the real story. 
Not suppressing this fundamental sadness, not pushing it out of the way, but facing it and realizing that someone has conquered it and that someone is Jesus Christ. Life has come to us, both splendid and changed, but life. Listen to the wise men who came looking for baby Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. The child was probably around two years old. And we read in chapter 2, in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay homage to him. He's our true north. He's our lasting star. He is our eternal light. He is our forgiver and our hope giver and our life giver and our joy. So I invite you with me to learn to live beyond the last word of our time and our culture. Jesus knew that culture would kill him. He was murdered by the crowds in Jerusalem. But that wasn't the last word. Jerusalem was destroyed by the crowds from Rome. But that wasn't the last word. Because empires always destroy empires. There is only one kingdom that can never be destroyed. And it's the kingdom that you enter when you become a Christian. According to Revelation chapter 11 verse 15. When God puts all things right, the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever and ever. Christ is the first word and the last word. So brothers and sisters, though the sadness might feel fundamental, the grace of God is more powerful, more present and more life-giving. And it is there, it is here in this room, waiting and pulsing. Wanting to absorb our sadness, to bear it, to transform it, and then to turn it into something. But here's the deal. Very countercultural for charismatics. We never get to avoid pain. We see it transformed by the grace of God. Until the God whom we serve, in the words of the promise of Jesus to John in the book of Revelation... In chapter 21, verse 5, we'll make all things new. Hmm, <laughs> all things new. The deeper grace of God persists beyond the trappings of our daily lives. Only the work of God in Christ makes us able to make sense of the deeper sadness. Only God can transform it. Only through him can we refuse to be overcome by it. His grace is older than death and wiser than time. God knows that there is more. And he says, will you trust me for more? We do not live at the table of sadness with an eternal winter and a dead lion. We live at an empty cross with the spring of hope and a living savior. That is why he came. To bring resurrection life. From the beginning of his ministry. Announced in Luke chapter 4. I have been anointed by the spirit of God. To preach good news to the poor. To release the captive. To declare the year of the Lord's favor. Till his resurrection. That's why he came. This morning I finished a series. On the book of Revelation. It was a very brief series. And we were looking at chapter 21 and chapter 22 of Revelation this morning under the title, The God Who Makes All Things New. And I noticed that in chapter 21 and chapter 22 of Revelation, as God makes all things new, there are 13 no mores. I mentioned them to the church this morning. No more darkness, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more temple, no more moon, no more sun. Because God is our all in all. I tell you, who wins in this mammoth life that we live? God wins. God won in the dirt of Eden. God won in the dirt of Jerusalem. And God wins in the dirt of our daily lives. 
amidst the hassle and the mistakes and the questions and the sorrows and the doubts and the despairs, amidst the goodbyes and the hellos, at the graveside, at the hospital, on the operating theater, when you're facing a bank manager, God wins. So may he give you hope tonight. You're not losing God when you lose me. You're losing me. And you might think that's a great loss, but you will get over it. In six months or eight months or 12 months or 18 months, God may bring you, he probably will bring you, a pastor with very different gifts and skills to me. But he still wins. He's the one that's at the center of this church and at the center of the church I'm going to and at the center of his church around the world. And he wins. What are you facing tonight? What are you afraid of? What is stealing your joy? What is consuming your heart? Remember this, God wins. But not automatically. Not for all of us. He has won for the entire world and asks you, do you believe it? And will you enter into that victory? If I could, I would pick you up and carry you into the kingdom of God. But I'm not strong enough to do that. You're a dead weight. You must make that decision for yourself. So what will define you as you leave this meeting tonight? Will you let God, the risen, resurrected, life-giving, joy-giving, sin-destroying God reign in your life? Will you believe the better story? Or will you believe the one that is most obvious to you? The promise is everything. And delivers nothing. That's your choice. Let's pray. I want to ask a very simple question. First of all, would you give each other dignity by... Um, Respect one another's dignity by bowing your heads and closing your eyes, please. Maybe you've lived culture's story, believing it's cheap promises. And tonight, you need to step into the real story about the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. Maybe you've done your dalliance, you've meddled with it all, and you're sitting here, a Christian, but on the inside you just feel hollow. You're stuck at a graveside because you lost someone or somebody did something to you or you did something to someone else and you don't know how to get out. That sadness can be swallowed up by the mercy and majesty and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It's a completely different story. I think some of you may have written the last line of your story anyway. And you think it ends in sadness and sorrow and despair. It doesn't have to. What if God offers you a new last line? One of peace and of hope and of forgiveness and of life. Would you take it? However old or young you are, here or online, if you would like to step into a life of following Jesus Christ, believing his story, would you just put your hand up so I can see it and I'll pray for you. Thank you so much. 
Take your hand down again. Anyone else? Thank you. Is there anyone else? What a wonderful thing. If you're watching online and you want to step into that new story, then email us, dave.criddle at goldhill.org. One of the pastors here will be able to help you. Second question. Those of you who are already believers, has the culture story had too much of an influence on you? Have you been shaped by it too much? And tonight you need to say to God, strip me out of it and put me back into the real God wins victory. I reject all the things that I thought would be satisfying because they're not. And I embrace again the cross and the empty tomb. If you need to do that, then please, would you now raise your hand? Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can take your hands down. So tonight, Lord, we invite you to inhabit our praises, to shift us from where we are to where you want us to be, and to give us the power and the grace and the courage to live in the victory of God. The reality that you have the last word in us and in the creation. Help us to think about those things that we must now face and deal with in order to live in this purposeful way. And for those that are hurting and finding it difficult, tonight come by the power of the Holy Spirit and give grace and courage and comfort. In Jesus' name, amen.